In the grim darkness of the 41st millennium, mankind is besieged on all sides by aliens, heretics, mutants, and far worse, eldritch entities beyond human comprehension and abominations that hunger for the flesh of men. The galaxy is certainly a dangerous place, but the Emperor's faithful, through his divine servants and many military factions, are at least afforded a certain degree of safety and the promise that the Emperor protects. However, there are planets that exist in the far-flung reaches of the Imperium bereft of the luxury of protection, forgotten sectors and abandoned systems where the Emperor's light has grown dim, backwater worlds whose inhabitants are all too often forced to face the terror of the grimdark future completely alone. The Summons of Shadows was a short story written by David Annandale and included in the Warhammer Horror Anthology Invocations, released in 2019. This is but one of the spine-chilling entries in this anthology, so if you enjoy these scary stories, I implore you to support the original release and help keep the Warhammer Horror line alive. I've included a link down in the description below if you'd like to pick up a copy of this book for yourself. In tonight's tale, we travel to a dying forge world, where scribe Hakob Meltinus will learn that there are more than just servitors and servo skulls lurking within the dark passages of the Administratum Palace complex. Something else is moving silently through the shadows, watching and judging his every move. This is a tale of grief and loss, of madness and monsters, of the consequences of broken promises and mankind's utter helplessness in the face of an uncaring galaxy. So come with me, my friends, gather round and listen well as we dive into another terrifying entry in the Grimdark Story Hour. But first, a quick shout out to this video's sponsor. In 2024, we're all trying to live better, healthier lives, and I'm no exception. Now, I'll freely admit that even though I love being a YouTuber, I can get a little obsessive with making content, and I've definitely been slacking in the health and wellness department. But thankfully, there's today's sponsor, AG1, who I've been using for the last month or so, and I've seen a huge improvement in my focus, energy, and overall well-being. If you're unfamiliar with it, AG1 is a nutritional supplement that combines 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients into an easy to drink powder. Not only do they only use the highest quality ingredients they can find, but AG1 is also NSF certified for sport. It aids in digestion by supporting a healthy gut microbiome, as well as supporting things like healthy aging, boost in energy levels, healthier, brighter skin, improved focus, concentration, mental clarity, and so much more. I love that AG1 manages to pack such a high level of quality and nutrient density into an affordably priced product. It's a huge relief knowing that I'm getting comprehensive nutrition that supports my busy lifestyle. I'm also wicked impressed by just how much research and testing goes into it. AG1 is backed by multiple research studies wherein 97% of participants felt more energy after 30 days. Click on my link in the description of this video or scan the QR code here on screen to get a one year supply of immune supporting vitamin D3 plus K2 and five AG1 travel packs for free with your first subscription. Big thanks to AG1 for sponsoring this video. Our story begins within the bowels of the Administratum Palace Complex on the dying forge world of Fumis. Here, in one of the labyrinthian facility's many transcription chambers, sat Hakob Maltinus and twelve other scribes. It was the scribe's job to shift through the towering stacks of records, manuscript summaries, correspondence reports, regulation amendments, and every other form of bureaucratic minutia. No matter how much work they do, no matter how many long nights they spend cataloging pointless records, their efforts never seem to make a dent in the mountainous piles of parchment. The transcription chamber itself was drab and gloomy, illuminated by a series of tall candelabras and a single dull lumen globe that sat in the center of the long table before them. The light they cast was flickering and just barely strong enough to read by. The air stank of acrid smoke, burning animal tallow, and dusty parchment. Overhead could be seen a series of hovering servo skulls that both monitored the scribes for faltering productivity and endlessly moved bundles of documents to and fro. Records the skulls deemed important based upon scrupulous criteria known only to them would be archived and preserved. Those that failed to impress them were moved to bins marked for incineration. Hakab reached forward and plucked a report from a nearby stack. 
The record was 50 years old and detailed the notable decline in vermin populations within the underhive after agri-world shipments had slowed to a crawl and the dregs within had turned to eating rats in order to survive. He grabbed another, this one also multiple decades out of date. It documented the sale of mundane goods between two merchants that, Hakab speculated, were almost surely dead by now. He knew that they didn't have much time left here. The Imperium was under siege, and the great furnaces of Fumus had long since burned out. Every year that went by, more and more of the planet's important personnel had been ferried off-world and assigned to new posts somewhere else within the Imperium. Soon, it would be completely abandoned. To add even further insult to the drudgery of Akab's existence, he knew that no one would ever read any of these reports. The Imperium didn't care about this world, its history, or any of those left behind to shift through its carcass for something of value. But to the Administratum, none of that mattered. All records, no matter how trivial, could not be ignored. All must be catalogued. No matter how much he hated this place and the work that he was forced to do, Hakab was thankful for something to keep him distracted. You see, tonight wasn't just an ordinary night for him. It was one that marked a dual anniversary of one of the happiest moments in his life and also the saddest. This was both the 30-year anniversary of the sacred union between he and his wife Velia, but also, in a cruel twist of fate, the 20-year anniversary of the day she and their twin boys, Balin and Eulis, were taken away from him by the Imperial War Machine. The twins had been barely 10 years old. They should have been considered too young to fight, but Fumus's population had been steadily dwindling for many decades. So when the tithes came for them, Velia and the children were conscripted into service. Hakab had never considered himself a brave man, but on that day, he would have given anything and faced any horror to go with them. But he was weak. His body plagued by arthritis and cursed with a set of lungs and a heart that never properly developed in the womb leaving him frequently short of breath and unfit for combat. Despite this, all were expected to serve, and Akab's talents were determined best fulfilled as an administratum scribe, and that he should be patient in his sacrifice. Of course he was proud of them, for what greater honor was there than to fight in protection of the Imperium? But even still, it hadn't kept him from mourning their absence. Every day of every year, he found himself momentarily distracted, overwhelmed by that deep and familiar sense of melancholy that he felt whenever he thought of his family. And it was in that moment that he heard something he hadn't heard in many years. A voice, just barely a whisper in his ear, that turned his blood to ice. He turned around and squinted against the chamber's gloom. There before him was a shadow a darkened silhouette of a woman that was eerily motionless despite the flickering candlelight that caused all other shadows to writhe against the walls. Although female in appearance and undeniably humanoid, there was something wrong about it. The shade was strangely angular, with proportions that were off just ever so slightly to instill a deep sense of unease. There was nothing about it that would cause a cob to recognize this thing as his wife, but he knew in his heart that it was her just like how that voice in his ear had been unmistakable, even if it had been cold and distant, like the wind over fresh snow. He twisted around so violently in his seat that he knocked over a stack of parchment off of the table, drawing disapproving glares from the other scribes. He quickly looked down to make sure the damage was minimal, but when he looked back up, the shadow was gone. There was nobody there. What troubles you, Akob? asked Arthur Tizian, one of his fellow scribes. It's nothing, Maltinus said. An archival reference, I forgot to check. He stood and walked slowly away from the table, heading in the direction the shadow seemed to have come from. It wasn't her. She can't have been here. He made his way through the chamber, passing towering storage archives, each over 15 feet tall, with rail-mounted ladders to give access to their drawers. Servitors climbed all over them, retrieving and replacing documents. The chamber he was in was so vast that the grinding sound of moving ladders and the slamming of drawers was swallowed by the space and reduced to a sound akin to distant falling pebbles in a dark, fathomless pool. A short distance in, he crossed paths with Avelia Revican, who nodded in greeting. Marking your day with thanks and contemplation, Maltinus, she asked. Avelia had been assigned to the administratum via the tithe at the same time that Akab had. Just like he, she too had seen her family conscripted into the Imperium's armed forces, 
and thus the two of them had formed a bond through shared pride and grief. At this point, she was the closest thing he had to what someone would consider a friend in this dreadful place. Well, I am. I trust you are too. Maltinus asked, distracted, looking past her. My thoughts are with Velia and your sons. But the Emperor protects, brother. The Emperor protects, he answered, smiling weakly and moved on. The Emperor protects. It was a phrase he had heard many times repeated throughout his life, one that brought comfort to billions in the dark times the Imperium was now going through. The hope that was embedded in that promise kept Akab's spirit alive, even if he had no way of knowing where his family was or what they were being forced to do or even what horrifying monstrosity they would have to face, he knew in his soul that the God Emperor was watching over them, that he would protect them and one day guide them all back together. He hadn't heard from them in 20 years, but he had to believe in this dream. It was the only thing continuing to give his existence meaning. Without the Emperor's promise, he might as well have just been another lobotomized servitor. What am I even doing? There was no one there, I'm just imagining things. No sooner had he uttered those words than he saw movement out of the corner of his right eye. Something was at the far end of one of the paths. He kept his head still, but shifted his gaze in its direction. There was another shadow, one much smaller than the last. Though it had no eyes or face to speak of, he could tell it was watching him. He turned the rest of the way, but as he did, the shade vanished. Once again, there was nobody there, but he knew that wasn't true. He had seen it. There was no doubt in his mind. It had been one of his twin boys. But then, to his horror, he realized he didn't know which one it had been. With a piercing shame, Balin and Ulus had blurred in his memory into a single being. If he saw them today, he knew he wouldn't be able to tell them apart. If further, he realized if that somehow happened, if they suddenly appeared before him, that they would both be men in their early thirties. But there was no mistaking it. That shadow had been cast by a child. He was seeing things, he was hearing things, he'd allowed his grief to cloud his mind, and now he was seeing specters and ghosts, ones conjured from old, half-forgotten memories that didn't even have the decency to be the proper age. With a sigh, he realized he had been away from his post for too long. He needed to head back, lest one of the servo skulls become agitated by his absence and report him to the overseer. But even so, after a quick glance around, he knew he wouldn't be able to shake this if he didn't at least make some small attempt at investigating to clear his troubled thoughts. He walked down the aisle and approached where he had seen the child's shadow. One of the drawers near the bottom of the archive unit had been left open. He looked inside and saw a large stack of unsorted documents, a labor that he realized would be waiting for him another day, or perhaps another year. He reached down and picked up the top sheet of vellum. It was an accident report, originating from a place Akab had never heard of called Volgast. The troop transport, the Exaltation of Faith, had had sealants on the ship's plasma reactor documented as being faulty and fractured. The supervising tech priest had ordered them to be replaced. Yet, according to the accident report, there had been a transcription error, and the sealants had instead of being registered as in need of replacement, were registered as having already been replaced. This resulted in the ship leaving port with the flaw unattended to. She had survived as long as her first warp jump, but when she attempted to translate back into real space, there had been a rupture in the plasma engines, causing a white-hot inferno to race through the ship's decks, incinerating all aboard. He scanned his eyes across the document until he reached the bottom and froze. There was the incident report's date indicating that this tragic accident had occurred only a few weeks shy of 20 years ago. Hakob felt a chill run up his spine and a foreboding sense of dread looming over his shoulders. He flipped through the document until he found a long column of confirmed casualties. There, listed amongst the dead, were the names Velia Maltinus, Balin Maltinus, and Ulysses Maltinus. His mouth gaped, his throat closed in grief, and the scream that shook his body emerged only as a strangled hiss. They had died twenty years ago, and their deaths had meant nothing. They had not perished as heroes fighting in the name of the Imperium. They were victims of a stupid mistake, their tragedy bearing no more importance than any of the other documents he spent his night shifting through. It was a single loss amongst many, an incident barely worth noting. The names clouded before him as he felt his eyes welling up with tears. He slumped back against the archive unit. The parchment crumbled in his trembling, clawed hands. Scribe Mountainous, 
You are damaging an Imperial document. Hakam jerked upright, his breath hitching. Overseer Terrison stood at the end of the aisle. She was a stern and unflinching woman, foreboding and pitiless as iron. Oh, uh, I was... Hakab stammered, barely able to think. Return to your post at once. I yes, Overseer. Everything in Hakab's world began to blur. He had no conscious memory of returning to his labor, yet he must have, as he found himself once again sorting through documents. It was as if his body was on autopilot, for there was no room in his mind for anything other than anguish, an overwhelming sense of meaninglessness and rage. He felt rage at a galaxy that would reduce every dream to ash, rage at the lie he had lived for 20 years and the lie that everyone in his life mindlessly repeated. Those empty, hollow words. The Emperor protects. The Emperor protects. No. No, he does not. The refrain tormented him throughout the drudgery of the day and pursued him still after nightfall as he made the long walk through the dark and bitter cold towards his quarters. The streets here were narrow, squeezed between high, decaying hab towers. The pavement and the facades were grimy from the soot and smoke that choked the air. Filthy gray smog rolled through the alleys, and a cob could often not see more than a few yards ahead. Snow fell in thick, sodden flakes that left black smears where they landed on his cheeks and slid down like thick tears. He had none left of his own, the grief was too big, and so was the hate. As this forge world's resources continued to dwindle, so too did its population. At this point, the sector he lived in was almost completely deserted. Entire hab blocks now stood abandoned, their windows as broken and dark as the blind sockets of skulls. Even within his own building, no more than a tenth of the units were occupied, and he was the only inhabitant on the sixth floor. Because of this, he was used to being by himself in the streets on his journey home. But on this night, as he walked the path he had done so many times over the years, he realized that he wasn't alone. He could hear the sounds of footsteps coming from his left and his right, echoing along beside him. He turned, and though half hidden by the fog, about a block away on both sides, he could see the shadow of one of his twins. They stopped moving when he did, and when he strained to look at them, they disappeared their silhouette carried off by soot and snow. But when he turned away and resumed walking, the footsteps returned. The twins kept pace with him, always lurking at the edge of his vision, always watching him, always judging. They're not really there. They're just what I want to see. This conviction did nothing to ease his growing fear, nor his suffocating grief. It merely highlighted that the featureless shadows were wrought from his fading memories and his inability to distinguish the identity of his own children. Although he couldn't see her, he knew his wife was here too, always behind him, always gone whenever he turned to look. All he could see was what was in front of him, the long shadow she cast that blanketed over him in silent, oppressive judgment. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. But it's been so long, Velia. I'll remember you though. Oh, won't you let me see you? He said to the ghost of his wife. To see her again, to see all of them one more time, was all that had kept him going for the last 20 years, and now he knew that would never happen. There was nothing to support his profound loneliness. An endless void of mourning opened before him. He collapsed to his knees, unable to go on. One more time, he cried out into the empty night. I'd give anything to see you, all of you, one last time. It was not the emperor he prayed to, as the pain of his betrayal and broken promise was far too great. Even still, the perversity of his loved one's death and the strange chance discovery of that report was too strong for him to believe that there was no controlling hand at work. It had been no coincidence. Something had guided him towards the truth. There was a will here, an omnipotent consciousness at work, a shaper of fate. Though the words escaped his lips as no more than a cracked whisper, the impact they had amidst the still night air felt strong enough to carve deep furrows through the rockcrete of the abandoned hab block. Grant me this boot. He prayed to that shaper. Let me see them one more time. The moment he formulated the prayer, the shadows vanished, and a heavy silence fell over the surrounding area. He was once again completely alone, without even the figments conjured by his grieving mind for company. He sat there, listening to the silence for several minutes before he realized how foolish he was being 
He was about to get up and continue on to his hab block when he heard something off in the distance. A heavy, dragging tread that broke the silence. He slowly turned around and stared into the swirling dark of the night as the noise drew closer and closer. Whatever it was, it was big and clumsy. In one moment, it sounded like it stood on two feet and was limping, dragging an injured leg across the rock crete, whereas at other times, it sounded fast and disorganized, a rapid pattern echoing off the walls between steps. The thing in the darkness screamed. It bellowed in both pain and anger, and sounded like a woman, or some horrible abomination, attempting to mimic a woman. He didn't stick around to find out. He leapt to his feet and ran. He knew that whatever this thing was, he must not see it. He ran faster than he had ever done before, even in his youth. His heart hammered out a painful, irregular beat, and his faulty lungs rasped wetly with the effort of drawing breath. He was running on pure adrenaline, but despite how fast he was moving, he could hear the heavy, lumbering footfalls and disjointed, inhuman screaming, drawing closer and closer. He reached the rusty, flaking entrance of his hab block, threw open the door to the stairwell, and blindly staggered up the six flights of stairs. Even before he reached the top, he could hear the thing below him beginning to climb. It thumped and slipped, slithered and prowled, each amalgamous movement echoing up after a cob. The scream came again, but this time it was changing. It was more of a wail, a choking, gargling growl of both anguish and hatred like a half-formed throat trying desperately to form human words and failing utterly. He threw open the door to his floor and stumbled down the dark hall towards his apartment. His hands pressed firmly against his ears, desperate to block out the thing's horrible cries. The lumen strips overhead barely functioned. They flickered and pulsed a sickly gray light that struggled and failed to push back the darkness. He reached his door and with trembling hands fumbled with his keys as he heard the door to the stairwell at the end of the hall begin to creak open. He was sobbing now as he finally managed to slam the correct key into the plasteel door and unlock it. He threw himself inside, shut the door behind him, and locked it again. Gasping for breath, Hakob slowly backed away from the entryway and listened intently for the sounds of movement on the other side. The thing was in the hallway now shambling ever closer towards him. He heard a hand, or what he assumed to be a hand, scraping on the other side of the door before it began to fumble with the handle. He froze like prey in the presence of a hungry predator. There was a long moment of silence, and just as he dared to let himself hope that the thing had moved on, there was a massive, booming crash as the door flew open, knocked completely off its hinges as if struck with inhuman strength. He stared through the entryway, into the gaping void of darkness beyond, and out of the abyss stepped the horror, and for the first time, he got a good look at his pursuer. His wish had been granted. The changer of ways who watched over those abandoned by the emperor had answered his prayers. There before him was his family. It was the one last look at them he had asked for. His wife and children had returned to him, but they had come back wrong fused into a single being. Velia staggered forward, her steps heavy with the weight of her sons melded with her torso. Their legs scrabbled for purchase on the floor, sometimes finding it, sometimes not. Three pairs of arms stretched out, hands clawing to reach a cob. The heads of the boys melted into Velia's lower jaw, and their mouths had become one terrible, distorted maw. The flesh of the monster was burned black. Crisp pieces of it broke off at a cob's feet. The maw opened wide, and at last, the scream became words. You did this! Hakob's family screamed, six eyes fixed upon him, hating him and his wish that had brought them back to this agony. And then, they were upon him, dragging him into the mass. His screams were muffled quickly in the nightmare of reunion. <laughs>